bipeds, quadrupeds, and even the occasional dinosaurs. It's me, Little Wolf, and welcome to my den. Go ahead, come on in. Go ahead and please wipe your paws before taking a seat by the fire. Um, just a quick thing to my friends who are friends with me on Discord and who talk with me in the chats usually, which actually is quite a few of you. Um, I've been kind of having a weird, I'm not really sure how to put it, like a weird anxiety thing happening with me, and so that's kind of why I've been a little bit out of it, a little bit distant, and things like that, and I think part of it had to be with my birthday, and stuff going on around that, and other things kind of happening in the background. But, soon here it should all be sorted out, and part of it is, I'm hoping maybe Saturday, tomorrow, I might find out if I have work or not. And even if not, I do have to find work to try and start paying off some bills. And that's another huge part of it that's kind of getting to me, is some other stuff there. But... I figured I'd come on today and just do a quick, maybe a quick, review of two of my favorite movies of all time. And they would be Night of the Living Dead and Return of the Living Dead, and for very good reasons. Now, oh, the cauldron is hot and bubbling. Um, I'm making myself some coffee right now. So go ahead and warm yourself up and make some coffee, tea, or hot chocolate. And let's go ahead and jump into our first movie, which right now will be one that I'll be watching later on, and that's Night of the Living Dead. And for me, that is definitely one of my favorite movies because it's a zombie movie. I love zombies. I love everything about zombies. And it basically started off my kick with all of it besides that and um, Carnival of Souls, which is another kind of a mind-twisted, like Twilight zone type movie. But let's get back into Night of the Living Dead. And the funny thing with that one is it's directed by George Romero and written by him and John so, and originally, from what I recall with it, he did not actually want to make a zombie movie. It was actually another creature called Ghouls, and that's why in the movie he, they are called Ghouls, and somehow that kind of got morphed into being zombies. And later on, he does come out and say, yeah, I didn't really set out to make a zombie movie. I was making a movie about ghouls. But, I mean, to see how it changed the horror industry with the look at zombies, for one, and then how kind of script writing and things like that kind of happened and changed because it was another one where you have a set group of people let's see here you have Ben as the main guy you have Harry Cooper who is a butthead husband you have his wife Helen Cooper um, you have Judy who is in the movie I'm not I think they're supposed to be boyfriend and girlfriend, Judy, and... Oh my god, I'm blanking on the other guy's name right now. Um, and then you have the little daughter who is downstairs in the basement the whole time. And... I just... It's one of the movies where I could... If I needed to find a movie that I could watch over and over again, this and Return to the Living Dead would definitely be on top of that list. Um, it's just... 
a fun movie for me where I could sit down, uh, turn my brain off, and just watch and enjoy a siege of monsters going after people in a house. And the other funny part about it is that the monsters really aren't the villains of the movie, and that's where you kind of have some other blend into other things, because you realize that it's not just the zombies that you have to watch out for, it's the other people that you need to watch out for also. And it's just such a great movie to sit down and watch and have a good time with, have some friends over. It's a great Halloween movie to set up and just sit back and relax and just enjoy that time. And it's... Sadly, it went into a public domain thing right away as soon as it was made. Because from what I recall of it, it was supposed to be Night of the Flesh Eaters. But then at the last moment, Ramiro decided to change that and made it into Night of the Living Dead. Would suddenly, because of the name change and the licensing stuff, it went into immediately into public domain. And so for a long time, uh, Ramiro really didn't make much money off of it because the the theaters and everybody else could just sit there and throw that up on their screen and just have a good time with it and do whatever they wanted with it. Oh, I'm looking up the info now, and for some reason I forgot that the Judy's boyfriend slash cousin slash we're not really sure, because they don't really make it clear, is Tom. And he's like one of your, uh, basically like your farm type boy, boy scout type guy, and it's just interesting to see how all of these characters intertwine and for people who haven't watched the movie which I would think is kind of a weird thing because I mean you could basically almost find this movie within any uh, horror movie pack because like I said it's public domain so people can just throw it into their collection and say here's this movie and shoot I'm almost surprised you couldn't get it out of like a Cracker Jack box or something like that right now. But it starts off with, um, you have Barbara and her brother Johnny who are driving out to go visit their father's grave. And it takes them about three hours to drive from where they were to where the grave is. And Judy is, of course, being the dutiful daughter and laying new flowers down on the grave. And Johnny, the whole time, is sitting there kind of making fun of her for it because he's like, I don't even remember what the old man looks like. And he's complaining, you know, the gravesite is so far away from home, you know, and if mom really wanted to uh, respect dad, she should come out to do it. And Judy or Barbara saying no she couldn't make the trip but as they're sitting there talking near the grave uh, you get your first glimpse of a zombie and this is the one that kind of gets everybody into realizing what a zombie could be or at least the modern zombie of being a shambler and things like that where they're not fast zombies, they're not running, and everybody always likes to think that zombies just want brains and brains and that's all they want to have, and that kind of blends into the next movie of Return to Living Dead. But I digress and I'm moving on a little bit to a sidetrack, and I'm sorry. But then, uh, Barbara walks up to the shambler because she doesn't know it's a zombie and decides to try and say, I'm sorry for what my brother's doing. He's being the usual brother type person and being a butt. 
and suddenly the zombie just lunges at her and Johnny comes back to rescue her and gets her away from the zombie and he starts struggling with it and at some point they both fall to the ground and Johnny um, from the book I read of it he supposedly breaks his neck when he hits his head and neck on a tombstone that's fallen over and it's just in the movie it's kind of hard to tell that and then the zombie kind of bends down and takes a big bite out of his neck and it, a lot of it's kind of hard to really understand when you see it on the screen but like I said I've read a book of it um, John Russo at one point came out with a book of Night of the Living Dead his version of Return of the Living Dead and then there was a third one that I'm forgetting what it is right now, but that's not really too important. And then Judy runs away, or why do I keep calling her Judy? No, oh, well, her name is Judith. But Barbara runs away, and she makes it to a farmhouse where she gets inside, and she sees there's a dead body at the top of the stairs. And she's trying to frantically call 911 on a phone that isn't working. Or I'm thinking it's 911. But, you know, it's back then, so she, she was probably trying to call the operator to get a hold of the police. But it's hard to tell. I mean, the time and place of everything that was happening. This is uh, 1968, I believe, was the first uh, Night of Living Dead movie. And as she's trying to do that, she races out the front door when she realizes that there's no help there. And that's when you meet Ben, who drives up in a truck, and he sees the other zombies slowly closing in, and he brings Barbara back into the house, and then they proceed to board up the house and try and barricade everything so that the zombies can't come in. And then you meet Harry Cooper, Helen Cooper, and, or you don't meet Helen just yet. She's just downstairs kind of yelling up, trying to figure out what's going on, and Harry's yelling down at her. And they have a weird, like, love-hate relationship that they've been married so long that that's how they are. And you meet Tom when he comes up too, and you get an amazing like radio report that's happening in the background because Ben has found the radio and is playing it and everything just kind of starts to slowly spiral from there I just this is like I said one of those movies where I I know pretty much every line to the movie like, unless they come out with the version where they've added scenes, um, and things like that. And I have seen a copy of the movie where they've done that. And I watched about 20 minutes of it and shut it off because, uh, hashtag this is not my zombie movie. But then, as they're trying to figure out, um, there's a locked... Um, gas pump and Ben just needs to get some gas for his truck and Harry finally kind of starts to help by saying that there's a, a set of key rings down in the basement maybe um, one of the keys will go for the lock on the gas pump and there's also jars down there and some kerosene and they're gonna make some Molotov cocktails to get the zombies to back away because they're extremely afraid of fire. And throughout that ordeal, Harry is upstairs lobbing the Molotov cocktails as Ben and Tom try to make it to the gas pump. And you also, oh, that's where it is. Uh, Judy is Tom's boyfriend, <laughs> but 
she runs outside at the last moment and gets stuck running with uh, Tom and Ben as they make their run to the gas pump and things definitely do not go as planned. There's a barbecuing and Ben actually makes it back to the house and things just even spiral more out of control there because the whole time Harry is trying to tell his wife Helen that he needs to get the gun away from Ben because Ben did find a gun in a closet and he found a set of bullets and things like that so later as he's trying to board up one of the windows as the zombies are starting to make their way into the house um, you have Harry who gets a hold of the gun and decides he's gonna be a big man type thing because now he has the gun he has the power and the control and that doesn't go as planned either he winds up getting shot and as I said before and other things I'm not too worried about spoiling this movie because it's a movie that came out in the 60s um, it's easily found I mean I could in the description I'll post up a thing either from YouTube or from IMDB where you can watch a version of this the one I'm going to watch later is going to be one that they actually went through and colorized the movie so that's going to be interesting to see it in kind of a different light and the zombies slowly start making their way into the house and Ben makes his way downstairs and they actually had a weird like three barricaded thing where they could put boards up against the door and so that actually holds the zombies back and Ben is inside the basement and he has to have some fun and shoot Harry which I think a lot of people when you watch the movie you just can't wait for that moment to happen because Harry is definitely one of those characters where it's in most horror movies you have that one or two characters where you just want them to perish and you get to finally see what happens and you kind of cheer a little bit on the inside when that happens and you also learn about it's weird to hear because the Harry and Helen have a little daughter and in some versions her name is Sharon and I think in a radio play that I've heard her name is Karen which kind of made me laugh when I first heard that especially nowadays with the debunking community and Karens it's like the attack of Karens and this one is I'm guessing around like 9 to 11 for the age of the little girl and uh, he, Ben has to wind up handling that situation too but he winds up making it through the night and when the sun is rising in the morning he can hear gunfire from the distance and throughout the movie and stuff like that you learn that there's a posse of the sheriff's department and locals with guns and things like that and this is Pittsburgh and it's rural Pittsburgh so uh, having guns and ammo is not too surprising and most households would probably have it and so they're the posse going through and clearing out zombies and you really do think that they're going to be able to um, wrap everything up within like maybe a week to two weeks to a month or whatever and have it all sorted out but as Ben makes his way up from the basement he gets close to a window to look out to see what's happening to people and one of the people sees him and to make it through that night of having to deal with Harry and seeing what happened to Tom and everything else it's sad when okay 
should I give this part away or not? Mm, I think I won't. Because this is like another one of those weird parts where even if I tell you what happens, it's different than seeing it happen. But I also want you to see what happens in this movie to get a handle on what really does happen. And it's definitely a movie to watch, especially get your friends around and have some fun with it, have some smoke, have some drink, um, have popcorn, sit down, and just have some fun. Because this is where the modern age of zombies began, and it's why George Romero is known as the godfather of zombies. And from there, it went to Dawn of the Dead, then to Day of the Dead, Land of the Dead, Diary of the Dead, Survival of the Dead, and just so much had happened. And usually a lot of it is like a weird, he throws in weird political things and things that are happening, at least at that moment and time, and he somehow integrates it into the story that he's written. And sometimes they're very subtle, and other times they're as subtle as a sledgehammer just smashing you in the head. And that's just so fun and interesting to see the beginning of all of it and also having a secluded place where there's only a group of people instead of having it be like a whole city-wide thing or um, stuff like that. It's really the beginning of when it came down to there's three to five to six people and kind of stuck in a single location and it's not moving around a map or anything like that. And so it's another reason why I would say I like the movie Signs and it kind of has that weird feel to it also. It's another farmhouse movie with a different kind of monster and everything else, but you follow that little group of people and they wind up in a basement too. So it's another area where it kind of ties together. And another movie that gives me the same type of feeling and I like it for it. And most people hate this movie, but it's the happening and you follow a small group of people there and it's the planet itself trying to fend off humans but again i kind of digress i mean it there's reasons why i love certain movies and if it can have that weird feeling of oh this is kind of another weird take on a night of living dead type story it will definitely capture my attention, it'll hold my attention, and no matter how good or bad the writing is, the acting, or the special effects, I can look past it and just enjoy it. And I wanted to figure out more what a ghoul was, so I did type it up into the oracle. And I don't really want to go here, but it's Wikipedia. I'm not really a big fan of going to Wikipedia because, you know, so many people can just add things into it and you don't, there's really no peer review of what gets put up. But it says here, Ghoul is a demon-like being or monstrous humanoid originating in pre-Islamic, uh, Arabian religion associated with graveyards and consuming human flesh. In modern fiction, the term has often been used for a certain kind of undead monster, and of course that would be the zombies. By extension, the word ghoul is also used to used in a derogatory sense to refer to a person who did delights in the macabre or whose profession is linked directly to death such as a grave digger or a grave robber. Um, I haven't really heard too many of the 
like morticians and things like that be called a ghoul, but okay. See, that's another reason why I find Wikipedia kind of iffy at times, and it's just anybody who can get on a computer can just go ahead and throw something out there for the rest of the world to read and see and hear and whatever else. And like I said, um, George, or yeah, George Romero and John Russo both wrote this story. And later on, when they were going to make a sequel to it, John Russo had wrote a story he called Return of the, um, Return of the Living Dead. And I forget really what happened, but the script and the rights were sold to a man named Dan O'Bannon. And he wound up being the director, and he kind of rewrote the story a bit, so it wasn't going to, like, clash with the Night of the Living Dead stuff. Oh, and if you can't tell, I'm just going to kind of segue now into Return of the Living Dead. Um, but Dan O'Bannon has done... Usually he did a lot of script writing and screenplays for different movies. He helped write the uh, screenplay and stuff for Alien. And that's where some people would know him from. He did another, like, weird, obscure movie when he was in college. I forget what it's called now. But they chose him to uh, be the director for Return of the Living Dead. And this is another movie that I will always love and cherish because for some reason up to this point, my dad... I won't say he would let me watch horror movies, but I was one of those kids who I would just sit down while he was watching something. And as long as it wasn't, like, too filled with swear words or too much nudity or too much gore, he would let me sit down and watch. And that's how I came to love the movies like The Vampire Bat, um, Horror Express, uh, the brain that wouldn't die and a lot of these I know I've kind of talked about before but these are the movies that really got me into liking scary movies and loving them and like the screaming skull which I just found again so I'm probably gonna watch that here soon but this was one of the first movies that I got to have fun with because they were having fun with the audience and the first thing they do right away when the movie starts is they throw up a weird disclaimer that this is based on a true case and the names and locations have been changed to protect the innocent and blah blah blah. But it really kind of captured my attention and realized later on that they're just having a good time with things. this, it, you find out later that they're gonna try and say that Night of Living Dead was a thing that really happened, and they had to, like, uh, put all the bodies and the dirt and stuff into a container, and somehow along the way when the army was like clearing everything up they were shipping the bodies to a different location and they wound up accidentally sending these bodies to a place um, that's called the Unita Medical Supplies which I believe is in Kentucky and the people that work there there's a new kid working there um, who is Tommy or no uh, Freddy Tom is the actor who plays him, and then you have Bert, who was the warehouse manager, and you have uh, the other worker there. For some reason, my brain is just kind of farting, and I can't really recall all of the actors, at least for some reason, that guy. And 
he's another worker there, and he's kind of like Bert's right-hand man. And he's gonna show the kid the ropes on what's going on in that business. And you find out, you know, whenever a place would need a skeleton, they would order it from them. Or you need bedpans, wheelchairs. They have a weird thing called a split dog, which is like a skeleton of a dog that's split in half. Or not even a skeleton, it's just like a little dog that's split in half. And so you can turn it around one area will be just like looking like a regular dog and then you turn it around and it's like the inside out man where you can see what's going on all over on the inside and somehow these the zombies from night of the living dead get shipped over to them and it being uh, freddy's first night working there um you have the other guy, yeah, for some reason, good lord, why can I not think of his name? Oh, Frank. That's what it was. Yes. I'm sorry, for some reason I had to look it up in the Oracle, and I'm going to hand in my horror card right now. But, uh, Frank is showing him the ropes, you know, telling him about weird things. Um, they have a shipment that needs to go out that is for a skeleton that's going to be shipped to another place and uh, it needed to be a female adult skeleton and so he's like showing them the shipping form that has been sent to him and he's explaining you know it's a 2AFPG and so they needed two female adult skeletons with perfect teeth and the funny thing was at this time for some reason there was skeletons that were being sent out to different places and for some reason all of the skeletons were coming from India and Frank makes a weird joke that they have to have like a skeleton farm uh, growing out there because he asks he asks Freddy you know how many people do you know that die with a perfect set of choppers and their puss and Freddy uh, answers, none that I could think of, or, and he's like, exactly, so they have to have some kind of a weird thing going on in India, and right after this movie came out, India stopped their shipments of skeletons going out, and then I think that's when they started doing the more fake type skeletons that you would see in medical classes and things like that, and it was just one of those things where it was just a joke put in a movie and it had actual real life ramifications um don't really know if there was really anything bad going on in india at the time but it just suddenly stopped sending out their stuff to everybody else and as the night's going on he, uh they're sitting in the office and he um, Freddy asks Frank, what's the weirdest thing you've ever seen come into this warehouse? Because it's a medical warehouse and they have, like I said, so many weird things. Prosthetic legs, bedpans, wheelchairs, and that might not be too weird for other things. But they also have a freezer that does have uh, cadavers that they send out to medical schools so that they can teach their students how to do like um, uh, I want to say uh, dissecting them but that's not the right term but you know what I mean and so they only have like one body in there right now and so with all of this kind of stuff floating around inside the warehouse Freddy asks him, you know, what's the weirdest thing you've ever seen come in here? And Frank suddenly kind of gets all serious, and he asks him, you know, have you seen that movie, Night of the Living Dead? And Freddy's like, yeah, of course I have. I mean, that's the one where the zombies come back to life and start eating the people. And he's like, uh, so what a what about it? And he's like, did you know that movie was based on a true case? And 
Freddy suddenly is thinking that he's joking about it, and Frank holds up like the Boy Scout symbol saying, I swear that it's a true story. And he asks him, you know, um, how do you know it's kind of a true story and what happened? And he was like, well, the army at the time was developing like a weird chemical spray to spray on marijuana. And it was called, uh, like trioxin 245, if I remember right. And, um, somehow that chemical leaked into um, a cemetery and brought the different bodies back to life and other people got wind of that's what was happening and so another guy had heard about what had happened and so he made the movie about it but the army went after him and said if they told the true story of what had happened that they would just sue his butt off and so they change around the story and uh, the military had to, like I said, gather up all of the dead bodies and gather up the contaminated dirt, put them in containers and ship them off. And Freddy's like, well, you know, if, if it was all kind of a hush-hush deal, how do you know about it? And, okay, I'm going to kind of swear, but I'm just repeating um, what they say in the movie or I'll kind of paraphrase and he says a typical army frack up they, the transportation department got the orders crossed and they sent the dead bodies here instead of where they were supposed to go and Freddy still kind of thinks it's a joke, but he says, you know, what we can do is I'll show you the containers because they're downstairs in the basement. And this is where you get to meet kind of the main zombie character of the Return of the Living Dead movies. And that is uh, one that they call Tar Man. And he is one that I will love forever because he is the first one that really scared me as a child because later on um, as Tina is going to look for Freddy because she knows he's supposed to be at work off work at this point in time she is in the graveyard across the street from the warehouse or it might be across the street or it might be a block away it's kind of hard to tell but she's in the graveyard partying it up with um, some of her friends and this is where it kind of blends in with the other stuff because you have a group of friends there you have a spider who later on shows up in a Friday the 13th movie you have Scuzz who's like a weird um, punk goth guy he has a mohawk and everything else you have Suicide, who is kind of like your typical, almost like a bad boy type guy. He dresses in all black leather. He has a chain that's wrapped around him. He has, like, I think it's either his nose or his lip pierced and his ear, and there's a chain going from that to there. And you have Trash, who is Lin uh, Linnea Quigley, who is... Uh, without a doubt, a scream queen, and just shows up in most 80s movies and a few 90s movies whenever they need a cute girl who would take her clothes off type thing, and she was playing a redhead in this, and I think that's kind of where I get some of my love for redheads, and, but they're all partying over in the graveyard while they're waiting for Freddy to get off work and you have another couple there who is Chuck and I'm also forgetting the other girl's name who's with him but he's always trying to hook up with her and she keeps turning him down type thing but 
uh, Freddie's supposed to be out of work at 10 o'clock. And she realizes that he's not off work yet, and she goes across the street or down the block or whatever to try and find Freddie. And while all of the partying stuff is going on, what had happened in the warehouse when they go down to check out the container where the body is. Um, they unscrew a lid, lift that up, and there's it's like a barrel that they put them in. And there's a little window that is on top of it, and you can see inside of it. And it has, like, in case of an emergency, call this number for the army, and things like that. But as they're looking at it, uh, Freddy kind of worries about it because he knows that there's the gas in there and there's the body and there's the contaminated dirt and he makes the line, you know, you know, these things don't leak, do they? And Frank just answers, leak? Hell no! These things were made by the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers! And he slams his hand against the side of it and that makes the container break open and the gas starts to spread throughout the warehouse and it hits uh, Freddy and Frank right in the face and they wind up passing out from it. And later on they wake up and they look inside the container and they realize that the body is gone out of there and they think it's dissolved. And they go upstairs and they can smell the chemical all throughout the place and they realize that it's basically permeated everything inside the warehouse. Um, there's a weird uh, cutout thing, or not really a cutout thing, but when people who like to catch butterflies and pin them to a board, there's a weird thing that has that, and you suddenly see the wings on the butterflies start to flap because the chemical has brought them back to life. And as they're walking around upstairs where all of the other stuff is, um, they suddenly hear pounding on the door where the cadaver is being held. And so that's when they realize that, that it has brought that thing back to life. And then they start hearing, and this is like one of the parts that's hard for me to watch, because they start hearing the sounds of a dog in pain and they walk over and they're looking around and they see kind of a dog on the floor and it's kind of uh, doing the whimpering and you can see it panting and everything else and as they go to pick it up that's when you realize that it's one of the half dogs that they had talked about earlier and they freak out they lock the one cadaver into the freezer where it was and then they run into the office and they wind up calling Bert and when Bert finally gets there he goes off on him calling him an idiot and everything else and always telling him you know haven't I always told you to stay away from those goddamn tanks and now this is what's happened because you won't listen to me and they're trying to figure out what they're gonna do and first thing they think that they have to do is deal with the cadaver that's inside of the freezer and um, this is when you kind of get another weird callback to the Night of Living Dead movie because in that movie to kill the creatures all she had to do was either shoot them in the head or give them a hard enough blow to the head where it would stop the brain from functioning and so uh, they call in the boss Bert and he thinks you know what I'll do is I will take a axe and just brain it in the head and that should be the end of it and the whole time you can kind of tell the relationship that Bert and Frank have, that they've always worked together for so long, because he's really tough on Frank, and he's yelling at him type thing, and being really mean with him, and showing, yes, he's very upset over what's happened, but every time he 
stops talking to Frank and starts talking to Freddy. He's like, he kind of switches gear and he's like, no, come here, boy, it's okay. I'm, uh, everything's going to be all right. We'll figure it all out. And they open up the um, freezer that the cadaver's locked in and you get this funny scene of the creature just running out of there and tackling Bert and crashing him down to the ground and they and then they wind up having to tie the creature down and with the fireman's axe um, he tries to penetrate the brain and Bert's doing that he has that and the it's not the blunt end of the axe, it's that pointy edge of the axe, and it goes right through the back of the head, and all that does is cause the zombie to start screaming and moving even more, and so that's when you realize that this isn't going to be the same as Night of Living Dead, and this is another one of the changes that it made, so no longer can you kill the zombie by shooting it in the head. And so they wind up dismembering the body and they're trying to figure out how to get rid of it. And Bert remembers he has a friend of his that works over in the mortuary area of the cemetery not too far away. And his name's Ernie and he's been friends with him for like 25 years. And so they wind up bringing that body over there and some kind of weird hijinks start happening here and I know I'm getting long-winded with this type of a movie but like I said it's my favorite movie and it's one of the things where I could probably talk all day about it but they do wind up burning the uh, parts of the body there and the dog and everything there and because of them burning up that body the smoke itself now has the chemical mixed in with it, and as the smoke is leaving the crematorium, it goes up into the clouds, and it's already going to rain. But when it rains, the chemical is now mixed in there, and it lands on the graveyard and makes those uh, corpses come back to life. And as it's raining, uh, the people partying there freak out and they start to run to their car and go in there and I might have some weird um, sound changes that are going to happen but I'm going to step outside of my den and kind of smoke while I'm talking about this because I'm also kind of excited and I like sharing this kind of stuff with you but um, as they're doing the whole bringing the body over to the crematorium and everything else Tina shows up and she is Freddy's girlfriend and so she shows up there and she sees all of the stuff that has happened there you know um, she sees that like uh, shelves are knocked over and everything else she can see Freddy's hat uh, laying uh, next to the door leading down to the basement um, I don't think she can smell the chemical anymore because I think at this point in time uh, it's basically evaporated from there and she makes her way downstairs and she looks inside of the container and the funny thing here is too is it's a weird movie uh, blooper too because she has to wind up um, she's just able to look into the container where the body was and of course the body's not there but earlier when Frank and Freddy had left the basement they closed the lid to the container but when Tina shows up she can just look inside of it the lid's not closed anymore and the whole time she had been calling out for Freddy to try and get his attention and for some reason whenever she's calling his name out I suddenly start thinking of Nightmare on Elm Street and 
yeah, it's a really good movie. It's definitely one of my favorite movie points inside of the whole thing. Because at this point, when she's walking through the warehouse, you get a weird camera angle where it's her point of view. And it's Dan O'Banion's homage to Halloween when you get to see what's happening through Mike's eyes as he's putting on the clown mask and he winds up killing his sister. But as she backs away from the container, she, she hears a noise and she asks, uh, who's there? And suddenly you get the appearance of Tarman and he just kind of pops his head out and you see this weird, slimy, grotesque looking creature. And, oh my god, that, I believe I was like five or six at the time, and like I said, I was the type of kid who would just sit down with my dad and watch a movie. And this movie does have a lot of swearing, it has some nudity, and so whenever the nudity would happen, he would just tell me a look away, because you get to see Trash take her clothes off. But, when the first time I really remember seeing Tarman, I screamed my head off and I was crying. And I think my dad thought after me seeing that kind of a thing, it would kind of put me off watching scary movies. But it did the opposite. It made me love scary movies and the feeling of being scared. And so, get to see Tarman and Tina tries to run up the stairs and there's also the third step from the top is uh, really flimsy and everything else and as she's running up the stairs from Tarman she winds up falling through that and falling down hurting her legs and so she crawls her way into like a weird storage closet down there that has metal doors and As this is happening to you, all the stuff is happening at the cemetery with the people running away from the rain and the people dealing with the body at the mortuary and everything else. And so, like, all of this stuff is happening all at the same time. You're just getting weird glimpses of each thing that's happening. But then you realize that the rain actually is hurting the people because since Trash has taken her clothes off, she's completely nude and she complains about it burning her skin and they think it might just be acid rain, but they're, they're sitting inside of Suicide's car because he's the one that can drive him around and stuff like that and earlier on you find out he doesn't have that much gas and as they're sitting in the car they start hearing the noises of the different corpses coming out of the graves. And they kind of realize what had happened. Um, they run away from there and they wind up going to the warehouse where Freddy is because that's where Tina is supposed to be. And they can, as soon as they get to the warehouse, they can hear Tina screaming downstairs, and they all make their way into the basement, and somehow there's a weird, like, division cloth hanging up or something like that, and, um, they realize that the other thing or whatever it is has wrapped a chain around the doors leading into the container that Tina's hiding in and he's hooked up a chain to it and it's hooked up to a crank so he's able to sit there and turn the crank to break down the door and just as the door is brought down they see where the chain is leading and there's a cloth separating it and suicide fl uh, moves over the cloth and that's when you see Tarman take a big bite out of uh, suicide's head and they wind up getting out of there. And 
I think I'm going to kind of stop discussing the movie here. Because there's so much in this movie that just makes it fun, and I don't want to ruin all of the fun for everyone for this movie, and I'm pretty sure you guys might be tired of me rambling about the movie. But, the fun things that they did change from it being a Ramiro movie to a Return of the Living Dead movie is that these zombies could now run. Um, you have fun little moments where they do wind up talking. You have um, a zombie that can hear a thing happening where um, the dispatch person is calling to see if they need more help. And all a zombie does is he gets onto the phone or he gets on to that and he says, you know, come in dispatch, come in dispatch, we need more paramedics. And so you also learn that these creatures can talk. And that makes it even more fun because later on they do wind up getting one of the zombies who is um, chopped in half and so they wind up tying her down to the bed and they ask her, you know, why do you eat people? And this is where the brains come in because she explains to him, it's not people, it's the brains. And they're kind of confused about that because he asks, you know, why the brains? And she's like, the pain. And he's like, the pain? She's like, well, I can feel myself rot. And he asks her, you know, what, eating brains, what does that, how does that make you feel? It makes the pain go away. And so, this is where you kind of learn, learn too, that they kind of did some studying into different things because there is like an endorphin inside your brain that will excrete a chemical that will help your body to stop feeling pain. And it'll stop it for a little bit. But this is the reason why these zombies eat brains is because there's the chemical inside the brain that makes them stop feeling the pain and it makes them feel better. And this is the movie where everybody talks about, oh, all zombies want to do is eat brains. And it might be true for other zombie movies that kind of do their own weird little spin-off of the, of the Return to Living Dead movies. But it's not true for all zombies, because you have Ramiro zombies who just eat the flesh, but then they're based off of the ghoul. And then you have the Return to Living Dead zombies who eat the brains, and there are so many other weird versions of zombie movies that are out there, and they usually come back because of radiation or some kind of weird chemical that happens, or like uh, a comet from like a Night of the Comet, and it's just weird things that wind up bringing zombies back. And like I said, I could probably talk forever about zombies. I love them. And with most of the movies, I love them too. You have Undead, you have Wan of the Dead, you have Shaun of the Dead, and of course, like a before, uh, Dawn of the Dead, Day of the Dead, all of those. I mean, they're just so much fun to just sit down and watch, at least for me. And I do recommend that you kind of sit down and watch some of these older zombie movies, especially if you're tired of the new ones that have come out, and kind of go back and see where a lot of this stuff, uh, see what the genesis point of it was. And even if you want to go back further than that, even go into things like Carnival of Souls, because they kind of have zombies in that too. Except I'm not sure if there really are zombies in it or not, because it's been a while since I watched it. I'm gonna have to go back and rewatch it, and it's one that's on IMDb, 
or not on IMDb, but it's in archive.org. So it's a public domain movie. It's easy to find. Um, you also have other ones like King of the Zombies, which is another one that's in public domain. Um, you have other movies where it's questionable if they're zombie movies, like the 28 Days Later and 28 Weeks Later movies, where they're kind of a rage-infected zombies, but I'm not sure if I would consider them zombies, because I don't think that the infection there actually kills them. I think it just kind of turns them crazy. But, I mean, there are there are so many zombie movies out there, and I know there are things like The Walking Dead with the comic books and the TV show, and I've only seen the first season of The Walking Dead, and my daughter really likes them, and so I'm probably going to sit down at some point and watch the other ones, because I do like one of the actors in there, which is Norman Reedus, and I know him mainly from Boondock Saints, and I love that movie too. But I'm going to have to sit down at some point and watch those movies, and maybe even give the comic books a read. And I remember playing the game board on my phone, and I did like the game of that. And there's just so much out there with zombies, and there's a big reason why it still kind of permeates with people. And I think it was Simon Pegg at one point who kind of explains why the Ramiro zombie is better looked upon than the running zombies. And it's another reason why he came out with Shaun of the Dead as being kind of a parody of um, Dawn of the Dead and things like that and he had such a love for the Ramiro zombie movie era that he wanted to pay homage to it. And give me just a moment and I would look up the quote. But it's just so much fun to be able to sit down and try and find the good zombie movie because there is such a plethora of zombie movies out there. There are some that are extremely terrible. Like, I think there was one, uh, Gangs of the Dead, which was very bad to watch, and it just wasn't really what I thought it was. It's another one that at some point I might have to go back and watch, because I only watched it once, and I was very unimpressed with it. But... Um, you have Children of the Dead, who Tom Savini uh, has a role in it. Um, of course, you have the remake of Night of the Living Dead in the 90s um, that had Tony Todd as playing the Ben character. And it's just so much fun to be able to dig through some of these and find the actual gems that are good movies and worth watching and then you find out which ones aren't worth watching, and usually those are kind of the Asylum-type movies, or even lower. I know Troma put out a few zombie movies. Okay. Let's see here. But, I mean, there's just so much out there to be able to delve into and try and find all of the things that would make a zombie movie good or make it bad. And I could definitely talk all day about zombies. I'm one of those guys who really digs into that pile of stuff to try and find the good ones, to find the Night of Living Deads, to find the Day of the Dead, Dawn of the Dead, the remake of Dawn of the Dead, I thought was really fun. Um, there are so many books out there, like I said, uh, John Russo wrote Night of the Living Dead, Return of the Living Dead, and I think it was like The Hungry Dead, I'm not too sure. But 
I found those books on Google Play and I definitely downloaded those ones. And so I just had a good time with all of that. And I, for the life of me right now, cannot find the quote about zombies. Um, but he, I believe he put it down as the shambling zombie is scarier because it's a lot like death. Because no matter how far you run from death, no matter what barricades you put up, no matter um, whether you eat right or you keep running, you stay in shape, no matter what, it will still get you in the end. And that kind of shows through with how the other zombie movies went in the Ramiro verse of zombies, because at the end of Night of the Living Dead, it looks like they're actually wrapping it up, and they'll be able to take care of all of it here soon. But we know that doesn't wind up happening, because they then have Dawn of the Dead, where it takes place inside of the shopping mall. You have Day of the Dead, where it winds up in like an underground army bunker. Um, you have Land of the Dead that takes place in a city area. And you see what happens there. You have um, Diary of the Dead, which is supposed to take place around the time that Night of the Living Dead was happening. But it's kind of their version of like a found footage film. And then Survival of the Dead, which is kind of like the Hatfields and McCoys meet zombies and it takes place on an island. And all of them kind of, at least from Diary of the Dead on, they kind of intertwine and you see different little threads that tie them together. Because in Survival of the Dead, you meet a guy who was in Diary of the Dead, who was an army man, and he kind of ties those movies together, and it's just interesting to see the evolution of zombies, not only in movies, but in comic books, and in TV shows, and, and in books. And like I said, I could go on forever about this, but I think I'm going to stop here. And I hope I kind of whetted your appetites a little bit for zombies, and I know zombies aren't everybody's thing, and I know these kind of movies aren't everybody's thing. But with it being my birthday, and <laughs> yeah, I just thought I would sit down and talk about two of my favorite movies that are out there. And I hope I've talked about it enough to convince you to at least sit down and give both of these movies a watch. And I'm sorry I did wind up talking so much about it. I just kind of get really excited with these types of things and I could babble on forever about them. But with, I would say with the Ramiro zombie movies, watch them all. They are definitely a good time. Sit down with your friends, have a drink, have something to, whatever you do for fun, do that. Or just, you know, be sober, sit down, watch it with your friends, and just have a good time. With the Return to the Living Dead movies, there were five of them made, and only three of them are decent. Return to the Living Dead definitely is one that you should watch. Part two is kind of a weird reiteration of it, but this time dealing with teenagers more than with adults. Uh, part three is their way of showing what the army is going to wind up doing with it. And part four and part five. Should you give them a watch? I, I really want to say no. Because it's a weird area where they blend the Return of the Living Dead zombies with the Night of the Living Dead zombies. The first time I started watching Part 4, somehow they wound up killing a zombie by shooting it in the head. And the 
first time I watched that, I stopped the movie immediately, and my longest mate that was with me understood why I was so upset, because they had basically, like in the Ghostbusters saying, you know, you never cross the streams. And in this area, they crossed the streams, they interwove stories that were not supposed to be interwoven. And on top of that, the acting is bad, the writing is bad, the effects are somewhat decent, but they, they really aren't worth watching, so I would say give them a pass, but definitely watch part one, part two, and part three. And if you get a chance to watch the movie Undead, um, there's another one, uh, Hide and Creep, which is an asylum movie, but it's fun. Um, there's one from, I want to say, New Zealand called Last of the Living, which is kind of fun to watch. And, but there are so many of them out there that it's hard to find the good ones because there are so many bad ones. And I understand that. So just go ahead and sit back and hunt through and try and find the different ones that would work for you. But with that, I would like to say, you know, we do live on one planet, so we have to share it. And I love all of you guys so much. And go ahead and, you know, like and subscribe if you like the different things I talked about. And leave a comment if you want to about, like, what your favorite type of movie is. Or if you like zombie movies at all or anything like that. And I'm gonna get off here and probably watch Night of the Living Dead since I did say it's my favorite movie and I have a colorized version of it and see if I like that one at all. And with that, I hope you guys have a good night or a good day or a good morning or whatever it is. Just have good. And be civil with one another because we all have to share this planet. And I hope you guys have a good day. And I love you. And with that, I'll talk to you guys very soon. Ta-ta for now.